Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Better With Money webinar, Switch On To Pensions. So why is it so important to understand pensions? Well, with life expectancy around 83 for females and just under 80 for males, it's not unrealistic to say that you could spend around a third of your life in retirement. And with the full new state pension currently at just over £9,300 a year, you'll need to consider how you'll fund any additional spending you expect or intend to make each year when you stop working. And as we'll see today, and as you might imagine, £9,300 a year is unlikely to cover much more than your very basic expenditure. But don't worry, the good news is that pensions are designed to incentivise saving for retirement over a long period to allow your savings time to grow. In 2020, 88% of eligible employees, that's 19.4 million people, were participating in a workplace pension and the annual total amount saving to workplace pensions last year was almost £106 billion. So those extra savings for retirement can give us more choice and flexibility in later lives so that we're not relying on the state alone to deliver the lifestyle that we want. So today we're going to look at some of the key features of pensions, how they work, as well as just some of the commonly asked questions around how much you should be paying in and what to do if you have other pension pots. Now, none of us have that crystal ball that tell us that's going to tell us how long we're going to live for, but it is a good idea to plan assuming a worst or in this case, best scenario along life. So whether you've just been enrolled into your first pension or whether you're further along the saving journey, the plan is that you'll leave the session today with a better understanding of what you have and some action points to take away. So let's start off with a look at some of the key facts about pensions. So pensions are quite unique in how they operate. They're designed as a long term way to save for your retirement. And as the rules currently stand, you can't access the money in your pension until age 55 which the government have said will increase to age 57 from April 2028. So it's essentially earmarked for later life. So by paying into a pension, you're effectively giving up disposable income now in exchange for money in the future. But there are a few key incentives to help make giving up today's income that little bit more bearable. So firstly, the government gives full tax relief on your contributions, which means that some of your income that would have been paid in tax goes into your pension pot instead. And we'll look at tax relief in a little more detail later on. Another huge incentive and big change was the introduction of automatic enrolment legislation in 2012. So auto enrolment made it mandatory for employers to put you into a pension scheme and pay a minimum contribution on your behalf, provided you're over age 22 and earn more than 10,000 pounds a year. And as the end of March 2019, over 10 million more people were saving into a pension compared to eight years ago as a result of being automatically enrolled. So from around 40 percent of employees, so two in five to the 88 percent stat that we just heard. So that employer contribution is effectively like a bonus. It's money on top of your salary. So you should always think twice before opting out of your pension, workplace pension scheme. Another huge incentive is the 25% tax-free cash that you can take from your pension. And this can be even higher for some older style pensions. So do check with the provider how much you're entitled to. In April 2015, the government increased the flexibility we have when taking our pension pops at retirement, which effectively means that we could get our hands on all of it if we want to from age 55. 25% is tax-free, but any money we take above that is taxable, like normal income, so not necessarily a good idea to take it all in one go. So, for example, a £100,000 pension pot, typically £25,000 can be taken tax-free, with tax then applied to the remaining £75,000 as and when you take it. So if you did take £75,000 in one go, assuming no other income, this would take you into the higher rate tax bracket, meaning you'd be paying 40% tax on some of the income, not just basic rate at 20%. So it is something to think about. Now, this flexibility was introduced to apply to defined contribution pensions, which is the type of pension that we'll be focusing on today. Some of you may also be in a defined benefit pension or final salary pension scheme, or have been in this type of scheme in the past. These types of schemes guarantee a retirement income based on how long you're in the scheme and your salary during that time. 
Now, we won't be specifically covering these today, as very few companies still have these schemes open for employees due to the high running cost. The exception tends to be the public sector um, organisations. However, I'm happy to take some questions on these at the end if you have them. So let's have a look at how defined contribution pension schemes work. So now the easiest way to think of a defined contribution pension is as a savings pot or a piggy bank in that how much you get out of them will really depend on how much you and your employer pay in. Hence, the contribution is the bit that's the defined bit. They're sometimes also known as money purchase schemes as well. Now, the added benefit of saving your money in a pension as opposed to a savings account is that your money is invested to help your money keep pace with and potentially outpace inflation over time. If your pension was sitting in cash for, say, 10, 15, 20 years, you could imagine how the real value would fall away over time as things become proportionately more expensive. And this is especially true at the moment as interest rates are so low. So whilst the government, well, sorry, the investment return portion isn't guaranteed, generally over the longer term, you're likely to see growth in the value of your savings. So the contributions paid in plus the investment returns you receive make up the eventual size of your pension pot. And the bigger the pot size is, the more you'll have to live on in retirement. You also have the ability to transfer pensions from previous employers into a new employer's pension along the way if you want to. And once you reach a min minimum age of 55, you could use the money saved in your pension pots, whether that's one or many to provide you with an income. So you have a few options. You can take up to 25% of the money saved tax free as a cash lump sum. And then you can either hand over the remaining money to arrive at in return for a guaranteed income for the rest of your life, also known as a pension or an annuity. Or you can keep the money invested and draw an income from the fund as and when you need it. This is called drawdown. So your pension provider will write to you with your options available as you approach your selected retirement age. However, if you get to that age and you want to keep the money invested, you can do so. So now we've looked at how they work. The next question you might have is, well, how much should you be contributing to your pension? Well, of course, everyone's circumstances will be different. There's numerous factors to consider when trying to answer this question, including the age at which you start saving, how close you are to retirement, and of course, affordability of contributions. I will stress that affordability is important. Don't leave yourself out of pocket and try to find the balance between living for today and saving for tomorrow. Now, a sensible place to start when deciding how much to pay in is to consider what sort of lifestyle and therefore income you're aiming for in retirement. Now, most of us will aim for roughly two thirds of their pre-retirement income, assuming that housing costs such as mortgage repayments have ceased at this point and wish to continue with a similar standard of living into retirement. But you may have a different idea as to how you see your lifestyle once you stop work. The figures shown here produced by the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association, which are after direct taxes have been taken and assume no rent or mortgage costs, show the cost of retirement at three different levels to help you benchmark against based on your needs. Roughly speaking, a single person will need around £11,000 a year to achieve the minimum living standard, so a relatively frugal retirement just under £21,000 a year for moderate and just over £33,000 a year for comfortable. So that's the difference between one week holiday in the UK, two weeks in Europe each year or three weeks. And for couples, the figures get adjusted to around £17,000, £31,000 and £50,000 at each level, respectively. Most recent government data from 2020 shows the average weekly income for all pensioners to be around £331, and that's after you take in direct taxes and housing costs. This works out at around £17,212 net per year. So that will place the average somewhere between minimum and moderate retirement income. Don't worry, you're not alone if you're not sure what you're aiming for. Um, according to research by the same association, 77% 70, of savers don't know how much they'll need in retirement, and only 16% of savers can give a figure. But there are tools to help you plan based on what you're spending today and what expenses might continue on into retirement. And don't forget to factor in the state pension as well, as well which can really help along to achieving your retirement income. So we'll have a little look this next. 
there were many the state pension will represent a very important building block in retirement provision, essentially the foundation of retirement income. For the 2021-22 tax year, the full new state pension is £179.60 per week or £9,339 per year. The exact amount that you will get depends on your national insurance record with 35 years needed to get the full amount and at least 10 years to be entitled to any. Within these amounts, you'll receive a proportion of the full amount. For instance, 20 years will entitle you to 20 35ths of the full amount. You can build up your national insurance record in numerous ways, most commonly by paying class one national insurance contributions for those employed or class two for those self-employed. And you can also build up credits towards your record when claiming certain benefits, such as child benefit for a child under 12. So being out of the labour force doesn't necessarily mean gaps in your record. You might be aware the state pension system changed in April 2016 with the new system we now have designed to be simpler to understand your entitlement. But anything you've built up under the old system prior to this date, which had numerous different elements to it, will still be accounted for. In some cases, you can actually get a slightly higher state pension than £9,339, known as a protected amount. And if this is the case, you won't be able to build up any more state pension. So your state pension is also increased if you decide to defer it beyond your, beyond your state pension age, currently by the equivalent of 1% for every nine weeks that you defer. So that works out just under 5.8% for every 52 weeks. So worth considering for those perhaps looking, continue, looking to continue working beyond state pension age, as this return is much higher than you'd get investing the same amount in a bank account. The Department for Work and Pensions predicts that between 85 and 90 percent of people reaching state pension age will receive the full new state pension amount. But rather than leave it to guesswork, you can go online using the links shown here. So first, you can check your state pension age, which has been equalised for males and females and currently stands at age 66. It also has some further planned increases with those born after 6 of April 1978 due to hit their state pension age at age 68. Unfortunately, this is due to the rising cost of the state pension as we're all living longer. You can also check your state pension forecast to see if you're on track for the full amount. I will point out that your forecast is likely to be more representative the closer that you are to your state pension age. If you are contracted out at any point in your working life, you may see your qualifying years being lower than expected. Being contracted out meant that you opted out of part of the state pension in return for lower national insurance contributions or a contribution to a personal pension instead. And this was relatively commonplace for employers to arrange, particularly in the public sector. If in doubt, you can contact the gov.uk helpline at the number shown. So now you've got an idea of what the state might provide, you can think about the shortfall between that and the income that you want in retirement, which you'll need to fund yourself. This money helper pension income calculator, which you can access via the Better With Money website, can give you an idea of what pension pot size and income you're likely to get based on current contributions and allows you to see the potential impact of, say, a 1% or 2% contribution increase on your final pension income or changes to your planned retirement date. The calculator also factors in the state pension and any other pensions you've built up. So whilst assumptions have been made, have been made around investment growth and inflation, it should give you a rough idea as to whether what you're paying in is enough. Your annual pension statement, which will come to you either via post or email from your pension provider, will also contain projections. So make sure that you look at this when it arrives rather than putting it in that classic pensions drawer that we all have. Um, and these should be slightly more representative as they are based on where your pension pot is currently invested. Your state pension age might not coincide with when you're actually looking to retire. So do consider this when looking at projections and how you might bridge the gap. So let's look now at contributions. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, auto-enrolment brought in rules around minimum contributions in 2012. So your employer must pay in at least 3% of your earnings between £6,240 and £50,270, 
with a total of at least 8% of those banned earnings paid in overall. Some employers will pay more than 3%, but you're expected to make up the difference between what the employer pays and 8%. A lot of employers pay a percent of basic salary rather than those band earnings, just to make things a bit simpler. So check your pension booklet or information to see what happens at your company. Remember, this is just the minimum required under the rules. It's only intended at the start and you can pay in more if you wish. It's also worth checking to see if your employer has a matching contribution system in place. For example, if you pay an additional 2%, they'll match it. So consider whether you're getting the maximum contribution available from the company. If you're a long way off retirement yet and aren't sure of what sort of income you're aiming for, a very general rule of thumb is to pay in half your age as a percentage, and that's across both yours and your employer's contribution. But remember, affordability is key. So just to finish off this section, let's have a quick look at budgeting. So it's a good idea to budget for pension contributions to work out what's affordable. Now, saying that for many pension contributions just will happen in the background and you should be able to find the level that's comfortable for you. It doesn't require any drastic changes to your lifestyle. If you increase contributions at the same time as pay rises, for example, you may not actually fill them at all. So to give you an idea, someone at age 25 on a £25,000 salary, giving up just two takeaway coffees a week from somewhere like Costa, would allow them to put in an extra 1% into their pension instead, accumulating to a pot of nearly £10,000 by state pension age. And this budget plan, which you can also find on the Better With Money website, will allow you to break down your monthly outgoings and work out whether extra pen pension funding is affordable. So do take some time to work through and remember, try to find that balance between living for today and saving for tomorrow. So now I said earlier that one of the incentives of saving into a pension is that you get tax relief on your contributions, which is given at the rate at which you pay tax. So if you're a basic rate taxpayer, you, you pay 20%, sorry, you get 20% tax relief. And if you're a higher rate taxpayer, 40%. Now, there are a couple of different ways this can happen, but a common method is what's known as relief at source. This is where your pension provider claims back the tax paid on your contribution from HMRC and adds that amount to your pension. So from your point of view, it's like receiving a bonus and everything you save. If you're a basic rate taxpayer, there's nothing left for you to do as your provider has claimed back basic rate tax at 20% on your behalf. However, if you're a higher or additional rate taxpayer, you will need to claim back that extra 20 or 25% from HMRC. If this is the case, you can either complete a self-assessment tax return and claim via the pension contribution section, or you can contact the local tax office, sending them a schedule of contributions from your pension scheme, which you can ask your provider for, stating that you've been paying tax above basic rate for X period and believe that you're entitled to further tax relief. HMRC will usually go back up to four years in respect of unclaimed relief, so anything before then may well be lost. The link here um, gives further details on making a claim and also links to information about the various pension allowances. So to put tax relief into graphical format, this slide shows the effective cost of making a £100 contribution, depending on whether you're a basic higher or additional rate taxpayer, assuming all of your contribution sits within the relevant tax band. So a £100 pension contribution effectively costs a basic rate taxpayer £80, as this is what would come off their post-tax pay. Pension contribution has become even more tax effective for those on higher incomes, as you're saving more in tax when you pay in. There are restrictions on tax relief placed on very high earners, however, so have a look at the link just provided for some further detail on the various allowances. Many employers have introduced salary exchange or salary sacrifice um, for pension contributions. So rather than your employer pay you your full salary and then deduct your pension contribution afterwards, with salary sacrifice, your employer deducts the pension contribution first and then pays it to the pension as an employer contribution instead. The advantage of this is that because the deduction is a genuine reduction in your salary, neither you nor your employer need to pay tax or national insurance contributions on that portion of salary given up. Another advantage is that all tax relief happens automatically, whatever rate you pay, so nothing further needs to be claimed. 
However, as this is a perceived reduction in salary, it could affect things like mortgage applications. So just check whether salary sacrifice is right for you. Uh, there has been some speculation over the years that the government could remove salary exchange as an option for making pension contributions as the government misses out on all those national insurance contributions. But currently, it's still a perfectly permissible way to save. And most of the largest employers will use this method. Your employer may also offer it, but they're not obliged to do so. So check with HR if you'd like to find out. Right, so now we've had a look at how much you should be paying in contributions and how tax relief works. Let's just have a quick look at investment of your pension pot and where your money may currently be placed. There's no pressure to go making changes to where your pension pot is invested, but I would encourage everyone to at least be aware of where they currently are and periodically check how their investments are performing. So as we looked at earlier, your pension pot is usually invested in stocks and shares to help it grow over time and hopefully at least keep pace with inflation. Typically, you'll be invested in a mixed fund, which holds lots of different stocks and shares, not just one company, just to help spread the risk. Typically, the further away you are from retirement, the more risk you can afford to take. And by risk, I mean putting your money in those assets, which are generally more volatile and likely to fluctuate over time, such as shares in companies, but typically provide higher returns over the longer term. As you can't touch pensions until you're 55 anyway, currently, they are long term investments and you have longer to rise out those market fluctuations. Those with a lower appetite for risk or closer to taking their benefits may wish to consider lower risk funds over the short term, such as government bonds, also known as gilts. This is so that their pot value is less likely to change as much in the short term, which is in particularly important for those that assume to take their benefits. Now, as individuals, you will all have very different circumstances and attitudes to risk. So it's important to look at the funds available and what they're made up of. Fund fact sheets, usually available via your provider's website, are designed to break down all the important details of the investment. If you do decide to do some switching, always check the charges of the fund you're switching into, as over time these can really eat away at the value of your fund. And make sure that you're reviewing your pension at least every six months or so. So along with auto enrolment, the government made it mandatory for pension schemes to have a default investment fund, which is regularly monitored. This default fund may be a lifestyle profile. And what these do is automatically move your money out of stocks and shares and into less risky investments over the short term in the 10 to 15 years or so before your selected retirement date. And the aim of doing this is to protect the pot of money you've built up and give you security about the money that you've saved. It's really important to keep your scheme up to date with your selected retirement age so that the funds are not switched too early or too late. And remember, you have the option to move out of this lifestyling arrangement if you wish, or indeed to a different lifestyle profile if your scheme offers a selection. Don't worry if the investment side is for you. Usually about 95% of people stay in the default, but it's important to know that you have other choices if you want them. So you've got a pension, your contributions are being deducted from your pay and invested in a fund. So what now? So I thought I'd put together a checklist of considerations and action points for you to work through. Now, obviously, the further, obviously, the earlier we start saving, the better chance we're giving ourselves for a higher retirement income due, due to years of compounded savings. But it really isn't too late to start. Remember that your employer also pays in, which is effectively like a form of pay rise. So check whether you're getting the maximum contribution from them and if you need to pay in more to achieve this. I'd always suggest setting your contributions as a percentage so that increases happen proportionately with pay rises. But also at this point, looking at where you can afford an extra percentage or two. So you don't feel increases quite so much this way. And if you're paying tax above basic rate, check whether you can claim back more tax relief. Which wouldn't get paid, uh, which sorry, which would get paid directly to you. Now, I can't stress enough the benefit of getting yourself registered for online services, a bit like online banking. Almost all providers now offer this functionality for free, which allows you to check your fund value, how your fund has performed, and to update your personal details, such as your address. This is so important to avoid a situation where your provider can't reach you and you lose track of what you have. There's actually over £400 million in lost pensions. 
And whilst there are things you can do to track them down, it's so much easier to keep your information up to date so you can always be contacted. If you have lost track in the past, you can use the pension tracing service and we've shown the website here. Finally, consider other sources of income in retirement and whether any of these could be moved into your pension to take advantage of tax relief. Some decide to look at this as they approach retirement and are starting to get a truer picture of likely retirement income. At this point, you may wish to speak with an advisor to help you plan. So if you do decide to take advice, make sure this is from someone reputable that is registered by the Financial Conduct Authority. There is a tool called Unbiased that you can use to search for advisors by location. It's not uncommon for advisors to offer a fee, free financial health check or initial consultation, which can also help you work out whether they're a good fit for you. Your pension provider may also give you the option to access up to £500 from your pot to pay for financial advice. This is known as the pension advice allowance. And you can do this once a year up to three times without a tax charge. But not all pension schemes provide this. So just have a check as to what yours offers. So lastly, here's a couple of links uh, to some useful sites to get guidance on your pension savings, including the Pension Wise service for impartial guidance to those aged 50 plus. Remember, this won't be advice, but it should help you setting out your options as you approach retirement. Lastly, please remember the, the fantastic services offered by the ICE Benevolent Fund and the Support Network who've sponsored the webinar today. They can provide financial, workplace and wellbeing support to you and your families. And I put their website and helpline numbers here so that you can find out more. So that's all from me, Sarah. Have we had any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Daisy. Uh, lots to think about there. Uh, we have had significant numbers of questions, so we will only be able to address a couple live, uh, but we will send out a Q&A document to address the other questions when we send out a recording. So first of all, Daisy, speaking generally, if my company offers both a defined contribution and a final salary pension scheme, which one is usually better? Gosh, there's a question. Um, so they're very different. Defined contribution pensions and defined benefit pensions are very different in how they operate. Um, you might find you haven't got the luxury of choice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, employers are either closing final salary schemes or not offering them because they generally can be a little bit more, well, a lot more um, expensive to run. So you may not have that choice. Um, if you do, it will depend on your circumstances because the way in which they operate is different. So a defined benefit pension, so not the sort of pension that we've been talking about today, provides you with a promised income in retirement. So it doesn't offer the same flexibilities. However, it is that guaranteed income, which you know, if you had a pot of money and didn't secure yourself an income with, you wouldn't necessarily have. There's also certain benefits that can be paid out to your spouse um, and in the event of death as well. Um, and you don't have to worry about any of the investment um, options or anything like that. It's all taken care of for you. Defined contribution pensions, on the other hand, um, are not guaranteed. It is a pot of money that builds up over time. But as I've just mentioned, you do have that flexibility. And um, particularly now, since the rules changed in April 2015 as to how you access it. So it's quite difficult to answer and without also looking at your, your personal circumstances. You can also look at things like contributions. The defined benefit pension might be asking for perhaps a slightly higher level of contribution, not necessarily. Um, but have a look, speak to your employer, look at the, the terms of the scheme rules under each, what benefits are paid out, what death benefits are available, if there's any sort of spouses or dependents pension that will be payable under the defined benefit pension arrangement. Something else to consider actually with um, defined benefit is that the, um, whilst the benefits are generally seen as sort of uh, more gold plated, if you like, um, and generally because you know, they're guaranteed, um, the death benefits are also not necessarily as flexible. So defined contribution pensions, you can now um, 
obviously depending on the scheme rules as well but generally you can leave them to whoever you want so it doesn't have to be a spouse or dependent it could be you know a neighbor a friend or whoever you know someone in your family whereas defined benefit are more likely to be quite prescriptive in how those death benefits are paid out um, but there's there's certainly advantages and disadvantages of each um, I just think if you're paying into a pension, that's absolutely brilliant. But speak to your employer, find out what your options are. Um, and if there is a defined benefit pension available, that that's, that, that is, that's a great offer. Um, but just find out a little bit more about it um, and what the contributions are and what, what the retirement benefits will be. That's great. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, another question. Can your family access the pension savings after you die? Is this the same rule for private and employer funds? Yes, that's a really good question. So um, as I've just touched on about death benefits, so the way in which um, defined contributions, the pensions we've been looking at today, um, they've actually improved in flexibility in terms of how uh, what benefits are available to your, your loved ones or your beneficiaries after death. So as I explained, generally check scheme rules, but in general, you can leave your pension to whoever you want. So it doesn't apply to defined benefit, um, but you can with defined contribution generally leave them to whoever. Um, if you die before age 75, they can be paid out completely tax free. There's a certain rules around the, um, the duration in which they're paid out, but generally they can be paid out completely tax free. And then if you died from age 75, it's then taxable at the beneficiary's marginal rate of tax. Now, again, check with the provider and what they offer, um, but there's nothing to say potentially that your beneficiaries couldn't go into a drawdown arrangement or continue with one if you're already in one. They may be able to purchase an annuity with your fund. And of course, if they are under age 75, they could potentially take the whole lot out tax free if they wanted to. Certain considerations around that, obviously now being part of the estate, um, but yeah, there's generally quite a lot of flexibility around leaving your pension. So if you die, if you haven't done anything with your pension savings, so it's still in what's called the pensions arena or pensions wrapper, then it's available for your loved ones to access. This is why it's very important to keep your um, nomination of beneficiary or expression of wish form up to date so that the, the trustees of the scheme or the administrators have something to look at and to go on in paying out your benefits. Um, but Yes, so definitely keep that up to date, a lot more flexible, check what's available under the scheme rules, it doesn't die with you. Um, but if you have purchased something called an annuity, so that's where you buy yourself an income. If you haven't built in a spouse's option, then that pension could die with you. So that's it, nothing else to be paid. But as long as it's still in the pension, it should still be available for your beneficiaries. That's, that's great. Thank you. And just one more question, because we have so many and I'm uh, aware of the time is uh, getting on. Uh, how can you check your national insurance record? So, yes, good question. You can go online and do this. Um, so there's a link that I provided earlier, check your state pension. So if you go to that link, you can, you'd obviously have to reg uh, register and log in via the government gateway, but you can look at your state pension record. It'll give you an estimate of what your state pension entitlement is likely to be. Um, obviously, it, it can be a bit of an estimate, particularly if you're quite far away from retirement, but it will be based on how many years you have to go to state pension age. If you're relatively close and you do see some gaps, you can then ask how you can fill in those gaps. Um, but you might well have enough years between now and your state pension age, whereby you're building up qualifying years anyway. Um, but yes, go online. You can also contact um, via phone as well um, if you don't have the option of going online. But um, yes, get yourself a, a state pension forecast and that will outline all of the years and um, the contributions and credits that you've built up.